And I'm sure because you're all parliamentary friends of, uh, of, of, of members of this group, you all know how important cities are. But to put it into some kind of factual context, the CBDs alone of Sydney and Melbourne um, generate, and I'm sorry to say this for people who are also very interested in agriculture, although agriculture is very important, but, but those two CBDs alone generate as much GDP as the entire agricultural sector in Australia. So I think, I think um, cities are fundamental and vital to economic prosperity and success. And in the context of Canberra, who collects most of the tax revenue, the city's urban success prosperity is fundamental to the, to the country for no other practical reason than it's fundamental to your tax base. So, so cities cannot be more important, and that's even ignoring the fact that that's where most Australians live. So, so you know, the city's agenda has never been more important than it is now at a time when the mining construction boom is, is, seems to be um, passing or, or diminishing to some extent. The, the, um, the, wor the work, the, pr the uh, jobs, the prosperity that's created in our cities will become a much more important part of our national economy than they are even today. So, you know, never diminish the significance of cities in our federation. Now, I'm, I chair the Committee for Sydney, and I guess that's probably one of the reasons that I've been invited here. The Committee for Sydney actually, I think, speaks for all cities in the, in, to some extent. Obviously, there are lots of differences too, but for any city, one of, the, one of the most important issues that any city has to do, and at a national level has to be done collectively, is that, there, to, that we have to, at the same time as creating greater productivity, prosperity, and livability in our cities, at the same time, we have to try to bridge the divide between the haves and the have-nots in our cities. And in an urban spatial context, that means time travel to work, access to, to jobs across the entire metropolitan area. Um, and, and so transport is a fundamental component of productivity and prosperity. Um, and in a, in a, in a city as, as large as Sydney, which is where the, where the CBD is kind of um, uh, right on the, eastern, on the eastern edge of the city, um, the, the, the important thing for Sydney, for example, to do is actually to develop, uh, will fulfil its destiny to become a truly polycentric city so that it's not just the CBD that's a, a really important crucible of productivity, but Parramatta has to fulfil its incredible destiny, and I think, I think the the um, the, the uh, you know time and history is on Parramatta's side. I think it's about to go through the incredible period of transformation, improvement, and change. But as well, other areas like Penrith, Campbelltown, and Liverpool have to really um, fulfil their destinies to be not just um, uh, town centres, which they are, and they're fantastic town centres. Uh, but they have to be improved of places for employment and opportunity as well as residentially. Um, at the same time, um, the whole city itself has to become more productive because that high level of productivity will determine, as I mentioned before, how, how, how prosperous the businesses are, how much uh, you know, production is thrown off per hour worked and, um, and, and in the process more... more um, more, more money is earned for the government, and but also, of course, for the private sector and the and the and um, the not-for-profit sector too. Now, you know, in, in when it comes to cities, geography and topography is one of the great forces of destiny. Um, in Sydney, and I'm, I'm sorry to keep dwelling on Sydney, but I feel like I probably know Sydney a lot better than other cities. But as I mentioned before, the, the most productive part of Sydney is really wedged on the eastern edge of the city. Um, there are. There's actually a brochure over there called um, Adding to the Dividend, Ending the Divide, which the Committee for Sydney did. Now, there's not enough copies for everyone in the room, but, but it, does, it does actually show graphically the points I'm going to make. That the, the, the zo zones of productivity are really the CBD, North Sydney, Parramatta and um, Macquarie Park. Uh, but, the, but the differential between the city, the city's up here, Parramatta's here, and um, are there are other little blotches. That, that really needs to be built out uh, much more, much more evenly across the metro area, and I think that's also the same for other large cities like, like Melbourne. Now, one of the in interesting features of our cities is that they are incredibly low density. They are some of the lowest density large cities in the world, 
And that creates huge um, challenges for transport. That's why transport in our cities is so important because there's such a long way to travel. And it's interesting to note that um, Sydney and Melbourne, uh, Sydney, Sydney and Melbourne have a, a broadly equivalent. Melbourne has even a larger footprint than Sydney. But, um, but both of those cities have a comparable footprint with London, which has a population of 14 million people. So it shows how low density our cities of, you know, four to four and a half million people are compared to, to other big cities like London and, um, you know, before you get to even smaller ones. I mean, Mexico City is much smaller than London and that has a population of nearly 20 million people. But I'll, I'll refer to London a couple more times in my talk because I think that as a, as a, as a you know, really, as a really critically significant city in the, a, a, a world city and a world city in a democratic um, democratic system, I think that we can ha we have a lot to learn from London about how they are governed and how they manage the challenges of being a big city and managing growth, prosperity and livability. Now, I think that many of our cities, as I said, really need to become truly poly polycentric. Um, as, and, and that becomes more important the lower the densities of the city are. We also, I think, really need to, and Sid Sydney's a prime example of this, improve the extremely fragmented governance of our cities. At a local government level, at, you know, because in Sydney there's about 41 local government areas for the whole metro Sydney. Um, but also, you know, to be honest, and, and it may be improving, I think things are definitely improving, but the fragmentation also happens at a state government level where often state government agencies are not working together and cohesively to a common purpose of managing growth, livability, and, uh, and uh, productivity and prosperity. So I think, I, think, I think that we have a lot, to, a lot of improvements to make on defragging the way our cities uh, are work and, the gov and, the gov and how the governance models work. And um, again, I think that London is a really good comp for good governance. It has, you know, since 1999 had the, the revival of the greater, a much improved Greater London or, uh, Authority, which has had a transformational effect on the kind of investment that has been happening in London. The local governments haven't been, you know, completely deleted, but they, they still exist, but they are much bigger pound for pound than most government, uh, local governments in, um, certainly in Sydney. Now, the other thing that uh, many, of, many of our cities have to do, especially our big cities, the Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne and Perth, we have to be really vigilant about about in constantly improving travel times over the long term. That's not, not just important because it creates a much better quality of life if people don't spend hours getting to and from work. But it's also really important for our international competitiveness. The Committee for Sydney com commissioned a survey on how to attract global talent uh, to Australia and what our, what, what our strengths and our weaknesses were. And one of the areas where we fall down is having um, uh, you know, traffic congestion is definitely one of our, our drawbacks. Our, you know, lifestyle, you know, beaches, parks, harbour, all that stuff's fabulous. But we have a lot, we can, re there's a really a lot to do to improve our, our public transport network. And we have to understand that good transit systems, that is mass transit systems, are a fundamental part of competitiveness in any city with global aspirations. So I would beg industry groups, governments at all levels to be agnostic and, um, and um, open-minded about which transit systems or transport systems work in any context and be informed by the GDP impacts of particular modes of transport rather than be having a hard and fast preference for any transport or transit type. We, need, we really need to deepen the productive centre of our cities and, um, and that is often driven by um, by good transit. Um, and um, there, is all, th there is also, I th just moving to another a slightly different subject, I think that a lot of, there's a lot of tension in cities about development and growth and how to manage population growth in particular. And we have to bear in mind that the population growth in Australia for the last 15 years has been at some of the highest rates than at any time in our history. Um, um, and so, you know, so how to manage that growth, create the housing and the jobs and the opportunities for that growing population is a very live issue in, in, a, in, a, in a wide sense. But it's, it's the discussion and the conversation is held back sometimes 
by what I would call hyperlocalism and fragmentation that I talked about before, which leads to the phenomenon that there isn't a very loud or a clear voice for metropolitan interests either in the metropolitan area itself and not always at a, at a national level either. And I would, I would give a huge accolade to many industry groups who try to champion these, these issues, but particularly the capital cities, Lord Mayors, has been very good at coming to Canberra and trying to have that conversation about about the importance of, of cities and, and trying to express a city or a metropolitan voice in Canberra. Now, I think we need to, divert, to adopt and assimilate some of the ideas, the new ideas, it's called, you know, some people refer to it as design thinking, where you need a, a really genuine, informed and wide-ranging discussion across a multiplicity of of um, interest groups and, and community members in a, in a narrow and a wide sense. You, real, you need really good disinterested experts um, who know what they're talking about combined with local community people and, and, uh, you know, and metropolitan people um, to talk about um, what needs to happen in particular areas but at a metropolitan level too. I think one of the great weaknesses with the system now is that we don't engage properly with younger people. Um, now, the fragmentation of governance and the, the, I think the sometimes the dominance of the metropolitan, you know, the planning conversation by existing homeowners leads to outcomes which, which have very low intergenerational equity. The development debate is often, in, in the inner city areas, is sometimes dominated by homeowning baby boomers. And that's to the great disadvantage of younger people trying to um, get their foot on the housing level. And we all know about the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the great inversion where there is this, um, you know, if, if housing values are any guide, this huge um, new preference or this huge transformation that many more people want to live close to the inner city than they used to. And, um, and so that that's putting a huge amount of pressure on housing and prices in the inner city area. Now, one of the things that actually informs how cities should be planned and built and designed in the future, I think it's a very personal view, is the idea that Corbusianism is really dead. Now, a lot of architects who love modernism probably would want to strangle me for saying that. But when I say Corbusianism, that operates at a design level. It also operates at a, at a governance level. Corbusian, Corbusianism, I'm talking in the sense that one great man or one great a government agency or one great agenda, gov uh, political agenda had all the answers. Um, and, you know, one of the examples I cite for that is that the public housing at Redfern Waterloo, where you have these, you know, towers, you know, with, with surrounded by public space where nobody ever wants to spend any time. That, that, that urban form, and I'm sure there's that urban form in all big cities, that urban form doesn't, simply doesn't work. Um, I think that now the, the way we build cities is to uh, understand the significance of context and the importance of knitting or stitching together the old and the new, because that, that, that is the way that you create great cities of the future, so that variation and diversity is essential for urban authenticity. Now, it also means at a government level that traditional government level land use zoning where you have industrial uses in one area and commercial uses in another and something agricultural uses in a well, agricultural uses might be separate, but where you have this sort of separation of land use zonings no longer applies in a world where, where everybody is, has a strong preference for mixed use living, for, for what, what you might call um, walkable urbanity. So strict separation of zoning and uses, I think, has a very questionable utility now. That's, if you like, that's another expression of the idea of Corbusianism where there is a huge amount of control of what happens. So um, I think um, compact and walkable urban communities is the, f is the future for a healthy life and soul of a community and an economic system. And that so um, strong sense of culture with more compact housing and a, and, and a walkable urbanity leading to people being able to lead their lives out in the street on footpaths and, and on bicycle tracks outside the home is not only just what people want, but it's, a, it's, it's, um, it's actually what people, where people want to work too. Um, and walkable urba urbanity is now the locus or site of most new innovation precincts. The business park has, you know, I think, 
the isolated business park, just like the isolated land use zoning, is going the way of the dinosaurs. Now, the other thing, geography is destiny, but demography is destiny too. In the 21st century, there is this huge pressure at the same time as the great inversion is bringing people back into the city. There is pressure coming from the Gen Y who, who um, are very happy to trade um, household space for compact living and urban convenience on the one hand and the baby boomers who are hitting retirement on the other, all putting a lot of pressure for con on, on, on uh, housing in communities which offer that work walkable urbanity, which is well connected and convenient. So we have an ageing population and older people drive less. There's, that's a well known fact. We have young people embracing active, active walking and, pu and cycling in public transport. And there's even a question now about whether we've reached a stage of peak car ownership or peak car usage. Um, next, next issue driving this is more people are living alone and deferring uh, child raising. And um, as I mentioned before, young families are trading space for convenience. And, um, and walkable urbanity is not only desired, it's preferred by many people, but it's also one of the greatest antidotes to what of one of our greatest public health challenges, which is rising obesity. Um, so I think that city smart growth is an, in, an essential part of our future national success, as is stitched together integrated thinking and governance about bringing together land use planning, transport planning, infrastructure planning and job creation. It isn't an option, it will be essential. So just quickly summing, uh, just quickly, um, I'll, I'll wrap up with a quick discursus into what I suspect, uh, what I believe the role of the federal government could and maybe should be. Well, I think the role of the federal government should be more than being um, a voice of moral suasion. Now, I was involved uh, um, um, from between 2010 and 2012 as the deputy chair of the COAG Cities Expert Panel, which was advising the COAG Reform Council um, on, on you know, trying to figure out what, um, what the indicia were, what the factors were in making strong metropolitan planning systems. Now, that was a really interesting project and, a very, and the report was interesting, but even the most, one of the most interesting things to me was that it brought together people from all the capital cities into rooms at various times to talk about various issues. And one of the most, you know, like, um, I guess, enriching things, certainly for me, but I think for a lot of people in the room, is that people would talk, look at each other, whether they're from Adelaide or Perth or Sydney or Melbourne or Brisbane or Darwin or Hobart, and they would say, gosh, we're all facing the same problems. Isn't that amazing? And actually, actually having everybody in the room understanding that everybody's facing the same challenges is, is an, an important idea of itself. Now, it's, I think it's important, maybe that can't be repeated easily at the moment, but I think it's important for that conversation to continue because everybody has so much to learn from each other. And I'd like to acknowledge Dorte Eklund, who ran the, um, the, 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 um, the, oh God, the major cities unit, um, who's now planning Canberra and doing a great job, I think. So, hello, Dorte. And so, so that there's, there's a huge amount to learn from what other cities are doing. Now, there are, and the other issue I think that's important is that we have to appreciate that all infrastructure investment in cities or anywhere else needs a neutral cost benefit analysis and transport mode agnosticism, as I mentioned, which is driven by what effect will this have on future GDP growth and livability. We need to take note of changing community and business preferences towards city centres and walkable urban living, as expressed in differential housing values. We need to promote higher urban productivity and need to understand that it leads to higher government revenues. That's a really important point. We need to understand that at the moment there is a very low awareness in the wider community about who is responsible for what with cities and there is consequentially a much lower level of accountability that, that we really need. And I think that that needs to be improved. Last but not least, this is a very fundamental issue. There is a really uh, big problem at the moment with our vertical fiscal imbalance as far as our cities are concerned. Because 82%, say for example in Sydney, 82% of the tax revenues raised are raised by the federal government. Um, and now, if the federal government plays a very limited role in how our cities are shaped and, and, and become, um, it means that there is a massive 
funding deficit for cities, and that will have, in the medium to long term, a correlative effect on reducing productivity and government revenue. So we need to understand that investment in our cities is really, really important. I think we need, I think in an ideal world, and I hope it happens, we need a cross-party buy-in into what is required to make our cities successful, prosperous and livable in the future. And we, we actually need new innovative funding models um, of how to pay for infrastructure, especially if the federal government isn't going to shift its perspectives anytime soon. We really need to look at best practice funding models. And again, I would encourage everybody to look at London as, as, the, as, the, um, as the gold standard at the moment, because since their governance changed, they have invet the, the national and the, and, the, and, the, and the city government across the electoral cycle are making huge investments in the city cross rail, which is funded by um, I think a very fair infrastructure levy that, that, um, that, um, that levies not just development but everybody who benefits from particular infrastructure. And we need to understand that um, consensus is really important for the future. But absent consensus, we need to get on with it anyway, no matter who's in charge. Thank you very much. <laughs> Now, thank you, Lucy. So, uh, some nice questions, please. That can be nasty. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that's really important from the start of the whole journey is that we need uh, access to toilets and internet for everybody to operate. Uh, the very well off will have that access to internet mm. access. Mm. So, one of your big concerns is cleaning up the city and that sort of stuff. How do we have, uh, how do we still make room for all those people to use it? How do we have a new idea or a hip thing that's not just going to Well, I think that I think that the the access of what what you might call key workers, be they ambulance drivers or nurses or you know teachers, yeah. So it's all these people need to have access to the city. That can happen two ways: either they can live further away from the city but have good transport transport travel times in, or there can be um, the promotion. And I think it's actually really important in any city to have a diverse mixed use demographically, socially, economically. I think that that drives what a city should be all about. It, city, the city cannot, the inner city cannot become an enclave for the very rich only. So I think that zoning that encourages um, and, and zoning in, in, inclusion, inclu inclusive zoning whereby you give uh, developers a benefit for promoting inclusive zoning is actually one way of doing it which is not which is not too painful for anybody, but there have to be there has to be a trade-off for, the, for the people building the housing. I also think that um, in Sydney, anyway, I can talk about Sydney. Um, I think it's starting to change now, but I think that um, I don't think the public housing agencies are well enough funding funded to actually provide the the public housing model is not really working, and there's a huge amount of community housing um, organisations in Sydney who ha have actually teamed up with a lot of large finance providers and banks to do c really creative um, affordable housing solutions in inner city sites and they should be encouraged and endorsed and particularly as part of overall um, large developments in, in um, brownfield sites. I think it's really an important point. Thank you for raising it. I couldn't mention everything in, in the time I have. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think that all local governments, I mean, Brisbane is so lucky and Jane used to be a councillor on Brisbane City Council. If I, if, I was, if I was in local government, I would come back as a Brisbane City Councillor <laughs> or as a government person in Singapore because either be work in Brisbane or be in a city state or London's a good one too. But um, I, think that, I think that you leverage it. Um, I don't think government can always leverage it. I think it has to be collaborations between the private sector and educational institutions in particular. I was at the the launch of a fantastic digital connection um, network of 
IT businesses and the UTS, you know, from all around Sydney, but particularly in the Ultimo Piemont area and the CBD, which is kind of like a collision space for innovation and creativity. And I think that that, you know, that collaboration model is fundamental. I don't think the, la the big Corbusian hand of government can really do much more than just build the infrastructure. I don't think, I don't think, certainly not the federal government, I don't think, I don't think we should charge them with, um, with public realm upgrades at this point. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's it's actually quite it's quite subtle and complex because you know Section 51 of the Constitution does not give the federal government any head of or head of power which is which is directly related to cities. You know, like I, in preparing for what I was talking about, you everybody in this room will be much more informed than me. But in the sub clauses of Section 51, one there are three sub clauses relating to railways and not one relating to roads. Now that. That would have been a function of the fact that there weren't that many roads and not many, not much interstate transport in 1901. But it's really interesting that I think that the major kind of entry point of, go of the federal government will be, um, uh, would probably, would likely be in infrastructure investment. And what I'm saying is agnosticism, GDP um, impact, productivity impact should be the guiding light. It was. There was a very, I can't just say, having gone through it um, city by city, it, there was a huge set of criteria. Um, it was, it, they were actually good. It was a very comprehensive set of criteria. Um, and it, it is a good, it was a very good framework for thinking about people's, uh, state's metropolitan planning systems. I mean, the governance uh, problem is actually really interesting because the state government has, uh, state governments have a very big arc of responsibility for city, city building. Um, and there's a huge chasm in places like Sydney and Perth and to a less, slightly lesser extent Melbourne in, in the governance size of local government and the government size of state government. So there's this constant tension when, when state government wants to step in and do its job to make up for the deficit because of the lack of scale of local government. And that's one of the biggest um, challenges we have. Right off the bat. Well, I think, I think um, you know, I, 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 I don't really think it's the role of government to mandate the life expectancy of a building when the, when the consent is issued. I think it should be built to last as long as possible. It shouldn't be last, built to fall down in 25 years. But, but, but cities grow and evolve, and especially when there's population growth happening. So you can't sort of, you can't set any city or any building in concrete or in stone in aspic probably is a better expression because everything's set in stone or concrete in cities. Um, but in aspic, forever, cities have to adapt and evolve. So, you know, in an ideal world, buildings would last a long time but also be adaptable. I'd love to see a framework where, and it would be hard to do, but in some areas where there's mixed-use zones in particular where the inter interoperability or interchangeability between residential and, and, you know, small, you know, wouldn't be good for a bank or anything, but small business use could be could be much more flexible than it is now. That's why I was talking about Corbusianism in terms of land use zones is a little bit old fashioned. We'll take one more question and then Lucy will stay and have a drink with you. Yeah. We've got informal ones just down here.
Mm. Yeah, I think, well, I think that, um, you know, from my time at the Tweed Shire Council, which is, you know, very close to Jane's part of the world, you know, one of the most, the places with the most flood, heavy rainfall inundation challenges of, in Australia. And, um, you know, for that local government area, floods and climate change were, were a really important factor. I think local government often, a local and state government often does it very well because that's, you know, I was talking about the heads of power, that's kind of like core business for state and local government. The federal government needs to have that conversation but it will by necessity be at a much higher level than, than the conversation that will be had at local and state government level. Lucy, thank you.